W.E.B. Du Bois and Marcus Garvey both shared a powerful belief in the global unity of African descendants. However, they both had very different approaches and different plans for making it a reality. They also both had a fierce rivalry with each other. Join me as we unpack their legacies and compare the differences in their individual approaches. As we look at each approach, ask yourself, which one do I identify with more? These two men are also a great case study to explore the impact of what happens when two great black leaders, who both want the same things, happen to have differences that cause them to clash with each other. It makes you reflect on how much more can be accomplished when we work together. Let's explore their contrasting strategies and ideas. We'll keep their great contributions to Pan-Africanism at the heart of our discussion. First, let's look at W.E.B. Du Bois. When you think of him, think of the refined, intellectual, more educated black men of the 1900s. Born in 1868, Du Bois was a historian, sociologist, and a huge intellect who laid the groundwork for what we now know as Pan-Africanism. He was a cultural nationalist through and through, always honoring what he called the African mystique throughout his lifetime. He is quoted as saying, The spell of Africa is upon me. The ancient witch of her medicine is burning my drowsy, dreamy blood. This is not a country, it is a world, a universe of itself and for itself, a thing different, immense, menacing, alluring. It is a great black bosom where the spirit longs to die. Africa is the spiritual frontier of humankind. Du Bois was all about self-improvement and knowledge. He believed that if people of African descent focused on education and intelligence, they could overcome prejudice and lift up their communities. In his work, The Conservation of Races, he highlighted that there was a unique soul that African Americans could contribute to the materialistic society of the US, but he also pushed for a broader perspective. Du Bois urged African Americans to look beyond their immediate surroundings, to learn about global struggles like Indian nationalism, embrace ideas like public ownership, and even learn new languages like French or Spanish to enrich cultural exchanges. He was convinced that international travel and broader cultural understanding would deepen their involvement in Pan-African affairs. He is quoted as saying, American Negroes will see how capitalistic exploitation, led by America, is exploiting and impoverishing Negroes of Africa and keeping them sickened and ignorant, and thus indirectly encouraging the color line in America they will realize how American Negroes are in the position to help Africa, not only by their growing political power, but by their educational opportunities in the United States. When once the blacks of the United States, the West Indies, and Africa work and think together, the future of the black man in the modern world is safe. Du Bois wasn't one to shy away from confrontation when it came to colonialism. He challenged the countries and individuals who wanted to keep it alive, comparing the potential tyranny to the dangerous ambitions of Germany. In 1920, he cheered on Jamaican revolts, referring to Jamaica as the Ethiopia of the Isles. That same year, he slammed the U.S. Navy secretary for the takeover of Haiti and declared that Haitian freedom should be a key issue in the U.S. presidential elections. But Du Bois didn't just talk the talk, he had concrete plans. He put together actual programs aimed at materially bettering the lives of Pan-Africans across the globe. His vision was to create a cooperative commonwealth that would include African Americans, West Indians, Africans, and those of African descent living in Europe. Du Bois had some revolutionary ideas to restructure black economies. He believed that with the right management and advice, the most educated and skilled 10% of the black community, which he termed the talented 10th, could eradicate poverty in urban areas 
by funding major building projects. His vision was to create businesses that weren't just about profit. He wanted to establish consumer cooperation stores where profits were shared based on purchases, not stock owned, and where every member's voice counted equally, regardless of their financial investment. Du Bois was ready to kickstart this plan in 1940, but the outbreak of World War II threw a wrench in the works. Another hiccup was his optimistic belief that the talented 10th would prioritize community upliftment over personal gain, which turned out to be less common than he hoped. Du Bois was in many ways a lone voice, deeply committed to both the progress of black people and the celebration of African culture, more so than many of his educated peers. Du Bois' approach to pan-Africanism had some standout features. He wasn't pushing for political or geographic unity among all black people, and he was clear about not supporting separatist movements. What he really valued were democratic principles. His version of pan-Africanism had a lot in common with Zionism. It was all about unifying efforts centered on racial identity and heritage. Du Bois was way ahead of his time. It wasn't until the Asian African Conference in 1955 that his ideas about pan-Africanism and unity among people of color were fully appreciated. Despite all his efforts, Du Bois faced significant criticism. Some called him an elitist. Critic Margaret Halsey suggested that Du Bois might have been caught up in the myth of the wonderful oppressed, which implies that just because a group is persecuted doesn't mean they're without flaws. Du Bois's view on international politics was also challenged. He saw white nations as inherently imperialistic, and colored nations as anti-imperialistic, but this kind of black and white thinking didn't account for the reality that nations of color could also engage in imperialism for their own motives. This is evident in his conflicting stance on some questionable Japanese actions in Manchuria and China. Even with his deep connection to Liberia due to the shared history of free families, Du Bois turned a blind eye to some of the country's practices like pawning, which resembled slavery. And when Ethiopia gave vast lands to Japanese interests, Du Bois celebrated it as a bond between Asians and Africans, not recognizing the imperialistic undertones. This complexity in Du Bois' perspectives shows that even the most dedicated leaders can have blind spots. His biggest critic of all, Marcus Mosia Gave. Gave didn't mince words. He saw Du Bois as a fallen warrior who offered little of substance to the cause of black people. He even claimed that Du Bois was just a puppet in the hands of white capitalists. Gave didn't stop there. He attacked Du Bois's publication, The Crisis, calling it reactionary and mocking its association with the upscale Fifth Avenue. The tension between these two leaders highlights the deep divisions in the fight for black empowerment. If Du Bois represented the educated, air-conditioned Negro, Garvey represented the blue-collar, everyday man in the street. Garvey made things personal, taking aim at Du Bois's mixed heritage. Garvey suggested that Du Bois was more of a white man than a Negro, and even called into question the sincerity of Du Bois' commitment to black issues, labeling him only a professional Negro. In Garvey's words, Where did he get this? Aristocracy from? He picked it up on the streets of Great Barrington, Massachusetts. He has been trying to be everything but a Negro. Sometimes we hear he is a Frenchman, and another time he is Dutch. And when it is convenient, he is a Negro. Anything that is black to him is ugly, is hideous, is monstrous. And this is why in 1917 he had but the lightest of colored people in his office. When one could hardly tell whether it was a white show or a colored vaudeville he was running at Fifth Avenue. Now let's get into Marcus Garvey. If Dubois represented the refined Negro, Garvey portrayed himself as more associated with the dark-skinned masses. 
the blue-collar everyday men and women in the Americas. When Marcus Garvey came to the U.S. from Jamaica, he carried a message that resonated powerfully with African Americans. He arrived at a time when the NAACP's efforts weren't yet backed by federal laws. The Ku Klux Klan was resurging, and despite the high hopes from World War I, democracy still hadn't delivered for black Americans. On top of that, a surge in violence against blacks created a perfect storm that made Garvey's ideas especially appealing. Garvey's version of Pan-Africanism wasn't just about education and intellectual and cultural development. It was about taking back Africa from colonial powers, which he saw as reclaiming a lost paradise. His movement gave hope to many average middle-class men and women who felt let down by America's promises. Garvey's also took a different route compared to Du Bois's beliefs on the topic of race purity. Garvey saw the issue of race as black and white, literally. He viewed mixed-race individuals, particularly those conscious of their caste, as intellectual traitors and enemies who looked down on the poorer black masses. I believe that white men should be white, yellow men should be yellow, and black men should be black in the great panorama of races, until each and every race by its own initiative lifts itself up to the common standard of humanity, so as to compel the respect and appreciation of all. This set him apart from Dubois, but it also alienated many people who just couldn't relate and thought he was forcing his Jamaican ways of thinking about race onto the American context where it just didn't belong. Garvey referred to his followers as fellow men of the Negro race, creating a unified identity. His movement included distinct roles for both men and women, with women having the opportunity to serve in the dignified Black Cross nurses and men being invited to join the ranks of the Great African Army or the Universal Motor Corps. Garvey's ideas caught the close attention of European governments. His message struck a chord with black populations worldwide, and as Garveyism evolved into structured programs aiming for pan-African unity, it raised concerns among colonial powers. The Universal Negro Improvement Association, aka the UNIA, established by Garvey in Kingston, Jamaica, aimed to empower blacks through education and economics. The UNIA had a business-like structure, emphasizing both mutual aid and economic empowerment. Members paid 35 cents monthly dues, 5 cents went to the parent organization, and 30 cents went to the local division. This strategy helped ensure a sense of security among members, something Garvey believed was a fundamental need. The Black Star Line Corporation, though it ultimately failed, was perhaps the most ambitious venture. In just its first year, it raised $610,860 through the sale of stocks and subscriptions. This investment allowed for the purchase of three steamships in 1921, after which Garvey embarked on a significant tour of the West Indies and Central America. Marcus Garvey was skilled at communicating in a way that resonated with the individuals who felt marginalized by society. He understood the psychological impact of oppression and tried to counteract it by emphasizing the greatness of African history and the potential for a bright future. Critics saw his grand visions of African empires and the celebration of African identity as distractions from the more immediate issues facing black communities. They said that while these stories uplifted people's spirits, they did not provide a pathway to improving their social, political and economic conditions. Just like Marcus Garvey criticized W.E.B. Du Bois, Du Bois criticized Marcus Garvey. He thought Garvey was responsible for bringing over the divisive issue of colorism between black and mulatto people from Jamaica to the US. 
He also felt Garvey was not even close to being diplomatic enough with the British, who were important for international business. He believed Garvey caused problems with Liberia, a nation Du Bois felt was important for African-American progress. He saw Garvey as antagonistic towards the NAACP, an organization that Du Bois was closely associated with. Lastly, he questioned Garvey's unrealistic claims about African-Americans conquering Africa and doubted Garvey's ability to manage businesses effectively. Finally, he addressed Garvey's public criticism of his mixed-race background and light skin by suggesting that Marcus Garvey was just internally hurt because he had been teased and bullied by white people, not because he had any real issue against mixed-race people. All his life, whites have laughed and sneered at him and torn his soul. All his life he has hated the half-whites who, rejecting their darker blood, have gloried in their pale shame. At the end of the day, Dubois and Garvey both stood for similar ideals. The core of it was that they wanted to see the black peoples of the world, from the Americas to the mainland and everything in between, benefit from the unity of Pan-Africanism. Du Bois's take on Pan-Africanism was deeply rooted in his appreciation for African culture and life. He approached it with the sensibility of an artist, valuing personal, individualistic expression and feeling, which made him more of a thinker and an intellectual. His work is valuable and his contributions cannot be overstated. On the other hand, Garvey's perspective was born out of living in a society where the dark majority were oppressed by a minority, making him highly conscious of the social and educational disparities faced by black people. He prioritized tangible improvements, putting material progress before cultural or intellectual achievements. This is confirmation of the fact that much of what we think of as objectively right or wrong is simply the product of our experiences. Both are necessary in order to address the different facets of a very complex issue. Each contributed their best work to the shared body of global pan-African enlightenment. Seen this way, the differences between Du Bois and Garvey aren't about who had the better philosophy. They were two distinct individuals who saw the same issues, but through their unique perspectives. Pan-Africanism was actually made richer because of the diverse views and approaches contributed by both of these influential figures. Whose approach do you identify with more? Are you Team Garvey or Team Dubois? Let me know in the comments. Also, if you made it this far, Give us a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button.